Introduction The history of modern Ethiopia is being compiled by the activities and events that take place each day in the nation's supreme and sustained drive for progress in all fields. As head of state, the prime mover and the driving force in this drama, the public utterances of His Imperial Majesty are, in many respects, a mirror of these activities and or the events that determine the course and tempo of Ethiopia's development. On the 75th anniversary of his birth, it seems proper and fitting to record some of the most important of these utterances made on the many occasions that merited public statements from His Majesty the Emperor during his lengthy, brilliant, and devoted service to his country and people. It is impossible to include all of the Emperor's pronouncements in one volume. It is hoped, however, that through those reproduced herein, the reader will get a fair picture of His Majesty's thoughts and ideas that have provided the centrifugal force of his 37 years as head of state and of the preceding years of, his early appearance on the scene as national leader of Ethiopia. These speeches, some of them excerpted, in the variety of occasions for which they were intended, as well as in the many subjects on which they deal, portray the breadth of the Emperor's vision. They detail the persistence, the determination, and the unflagging drive with which he pursued the application of modern Ethiopianism to which history cannot fail to testify. The Emperor's idealism, coupled with his insistence on transforming his country, both on the domestic and international fronts, his courage in the face of adversity, his unchallenged perspicacity, his keen sense in evaluating world events, his unfailing respect for principles, and his abiding faith in humanity, aspects of all of which are found in his public utterances, should make this volume a ready reference to certain phases of the history of modern Ethiopia. As the central figure in the renaissance of the nation after its five years of trials in the late 1930s, his imperial majesty's vital and indispensable leadership has played a distinctive and decisive role. His appearance before the League of Nations and his impassioned plea for justice for Ethiopia and all small nations and for international morality still remain a classic example both of the breadth of his vision and of a profound comprehension of the foibles of international life. Subsequently, despite the failure of the League of Nations to live up to its covenant and the grueling distress that both the Emperor and his country suffered as a result, Ethiopia, under his leadership, was among the first nations which, at San Francisco in 1945, built the United Nations on the ashes of its predecessor, the defunct League of Nations. In these pages will be found expressions of the spirit and the faith that animated the Emperor in this lofty role in international politics. His primary motivation, that of raising the standard of living of the Ethiopian people and restoring the ancient stature and glory of his nation, runs through the theme of the majority of his public utterances. In them can be clearly seen the inseparable impulse of his whole career. This dedication was amply exposed as he spoke to his people and the world in the speeches contained in this book. Although an ardent reformer, Emperor Haile Selassie is no iconoclast. Thus, he has advanced the policy of modern Ethiopianism a philosophy which he has put into practice from the earliest years of his public career. The Emperor, addressing the nation on the 24th anniversary of Ethiopia's victory over aggression, said, Ethiopia is an ancient land and her civilization is the result of the harmonious alchemy of the past and the present and upon which we confidently build for the future. This heritage is the bedrock of modern Ethiopia. In it the people have chosen to distill from the past that which is useful and enduring, to adapt those worthwhile attributes of our present-day world and to fashion this modern Ethiopianism, the foundation of our social order that has served so admirably the purpose of the nation's steady advance. An absorbing interest in youth has characterized the emperor's entire public career, and is infinitely more than just a formal, enlightened paternalism. It is grounded in the fact, so frequently expressed by him, that his Ethiopia is built around the future. Haile Selassie I will go down in history as a leader whose concern for posterity has been both avid and constant. He has always kept close to the people and in particular to the nation's youth in whom, as the speeches herein illustrate, he places immeasurable faith and confidence. His Imperial Majesty's constructive influence has been particularly effective in Africa's political emancipation. 
Recalling the days when Africa was a sea of colonialism to the emergence of the Organization of African Unity, Haile Selassie I has been both a symbol and a pillar of strength to Africa as its people fought progressively for their ultimate liberation from colonialism. Today he still stands four square behind the cause of the complete freedom of the continent in which Ethiopia is the oldest sovereign state. His Imperial Majesty's faith in divine providence is a built-in factor in his personal armory. Institutionally, he is defender of the faith, and history will most certainly assess his era as the one in which the Ethiopian Church succeeded in, winning its independence and autonomy after centuries of tutelage under the Alexandrian Patriarchate. In times, good or bad, the Emperor's abiding faith in the Almighty seems to have been both harbinger and fortress, it being rare for him to make any public utterance without calling on divine guidance and acknowledging publicly his thanks for God's beneficence. Minister of State of Information The Selected Speeches of His Imperial Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie I, pages 1-18. Chapter 1 Part 1 Higher Education one of the emperor's fondest dreams came true on December 16, 1961, when he convened at the Haile Selassie First University in the presence of representatives from many world-renowned universities. It was an occasion of pardonable pride for he had sown the seed and nurtured the plant that on that day blossomed into full maturity. Prior to this event, to fill the gap, hundreds of Ethiopians were sent to institutions of higher learning abroad, a project that began in the earliest years of his ascension to the throne. In the speeches that follow, His Majesty the Emperor deals with the many stages of this development and sets forth the hopes and aspirations of higher education in the country. Laying Foundation Stone Haile Selassie I University In the field of education, we take great pleasure in the fact that the opening of Ethiopia's first university is near at hand. Henceforth, Students who have demonstrated their capacity and ability will no longer leave their homeland to pursue higher education. The university's faculty is being recruited and its physical plant is being established. We ourselves have presented our Gwinit Lul Palace and its grounds, inherited from our beloved father, as a free gift to the nation, to serve as the nucleus of the university's physical facilities, and a formal ceremony for the handing over of the palace will be held in the near future. The population of our capital, Addis Ababa, have expressed through their mayor, their desire to erect a monument to our honor, that they on their own initiative, have started raising funds, and have requested that we lay the foundation stone of this memorial today. It has also been confirmed that the whole people of Ethiopia have joined hands with the people of Addis Ababa in this effort. Dash 1 dash. Higher Education as was indicated on the occasion of our birthday anniversary on July 23rd last, we shall now make known to you our intentions in reference to this monument. We wish first of all to state that our heart was touched with our beloved people's desire to erect in our honor a statue in recognition of services which we have rendered to them and to our country. There can be no better way for a people to show their deep gratitude to their sovereign. By what means can man's achievements in this world be best remembered? Many people believe that this could be done by the erection of physical and material structures, others believe that their works are in themselves lasting monuments. We, for our part, think that man's contributions which live to influence the life and progress of posterity, are the most permanent monuments that can ever be erected. It is now 32 years since we assumed the high service of aiding and guiding the destinies of our people, counting from our regency, when we were destined to the imperial throne of Ethiopia. During this period of our reign, a series of problems and trials have had to be faced. There can be no better testimony to the recognition of our devotion to the cause of our country and to the welfare of our people, entrusted to our care, from the day when we were chosen with the grace of Almighty God the anointed Emperor of Ethiopia, than this expression of noble sentiments from our beloved and loyal people. We have abiding faith that the Almighty, who has vouchsafed us the privilege to reach this present stage, will grant to Ethiopia a bright future and an enduring destiny. Now, when our people are willing to erect a statue in our image, 
we feel it a duty on our part to consider what would be the most appropriate means of incorporating in a concrete and lasting manner the sentiments of our people. Dash 2 dash. Higher education. University, a symbol of mutual gratitude. Any monument to be left for our people, to be permanent, must be erected upon spiritual foundations. It is widely known that during our reign, we spared no effort to promote and extend education and to cultivate the spirit and mind of our people. It is our sincere wish to intimately connect the statue our people intend to erect in our image and in our honor with a living monument in remembrance of our people's goodwill, which will go down in history from generation to generation linking together perennially the affection of a people to its sovereign. Our beloved people, in contemplating the erection of a monument in our honor, and we, on our part, to express our satisfaction and recognize this gratitude, have decided that on this same spot, where our people have resolved to build with the funds voluntarily subscribed a statue to us, that a university be erected and established for the education of Ethiopia's youth so as to allow them and future generations to benefit from this happy event. While giving this site for the building and establishment of a university to represent at the same time a monument to your emperor, for the service and the benefit of your children and the future generations and to stand as a symbol of mutual gratitude between your sovereign and his people, we now lay the foundation stone of the university. The salvation of our country, Ethiopia, as we have repeatedly stated to you, lies primarily in education. As Ethiopia is one, all Ethiopians are also one, and education is the only way to maintain this condition. November 7th. 1949-3- Higher Education UCAA Opens Knowledge paves the way to love, and love in its turn fosters understanding, and leads one along the path of great common achievements, when today is being opened this university college. Our feeling of joy has two motivations, our happiness is of two kinds. These are private and common. Happiness shared with many creates a source of permanent affection and understanding. But private happiness is a temporary matter. Our endeavor to expand schools has passed from planning to achievement. Our satisfaction in the field of education is in our days being shared by the Ethiopian people, and particularly by those who have and are profiting by it. Thus, our saying that this would benefit Ethiopia is now being increased greatly. As has been pointed out by our Vice Minister, work on the university is progressing rapidly. To make successful the work of those educational institutions of higher education, aid of the students and teachers is needed. We hope that the preparation of students and teachers is nearing completion. We are proud to see Ethiopian youth thirsting for learning. Although the fruits of education can be applied to evil as well as to good things, you Ethiopian students should avoid having a bad reputation and be eager and energetic in your studies, be loyal to your country and obedient to your teachers, eschew lies and follow truth, respect good and be heirs of good work. February 27, 1951 Agricultural College, Graduation From the beginnings of recorded history, right up to the Middle Ages, and even as late as the beginning of the industrial age in which we live, Agriculture has always constituted the fundamental source of wealth for the human race. It gives us great pleasure to be present here to inaugurate the College of Agriculture and Mechanical Arts, an occasion which marks a great and far-reaching advance in our program for the promotion of agricultural education. This institution will serve as a source of inspiration in carrying out the agricultural program which we have laid down for the future. In establishing this college for the development of the natural wealth of our country, agriculture and animal husbandry, on modern and scientific lines, our main purpose has not been merely to develop and utilize these basic resources to supply the daily needs of our people, but, in addition, to produce a surplus to be shared with other countries of the world. Ethiopia, to some degree, has done this in the past. For example, when the world was sorely distressed by lack of food immediately after the Second World War, our country, although she herself had for five long years been struggling to recover from the terrible damage inflicted upon her during the war, was yet able to perform a significant service in supplying foodstuffs to the countries of the Middle East. 
and we have been pleased to observe how, since then, our people have increasingly devoted themselves to improving the agriculture of our country. A country and a people that become self-sufficient by the development of agriculture can look forward with confidence to the future. Agriculture is not only the chief among those fundamental and ancient tasks which have been essential to the survival of mankind, but also ranks first among the prerequisites to industrial and other developments. Solid Agricultural Base History affords us ample evidence that mankind abandoned its nomadic way of life and developed a settled, communal economy only when man became skilled and competent in agricultural techniques. From the beginnings of recorded history, right up to the Middle Ages, and even as late as the beginning of the industrial age in which we now live, agriculture has always constituted the fundamental source of wealth for the human race. Only when a solid agricultural base has been laid for our country's commercial and industrial growth can we ensure the attainment of the ultimate goal of our development program, namely, a high standard of living for our people. Commerce and industry, being concerned in the main with production and distribution, can only develop and profit from existing resources, but cannot actually create things which did not exist before. Most of the districts of our horror province are populated mainly by nomadic people. Now that we are in a position to anticipate an adequate water supply from the rivers and wells in the region, the area will flourish and land will no longer lie fallow in the province if only the people of Ogaden, ESA, and Adal could be educated in agricultural techniques. All this can be attained only by means of the wisdom which flows from the fountain of education. While this college will serve the whole of our country, its being established in the province of horror is the result of careful planning and consideration on our part. Even in this nuclear age, in spite of the revolutionary changes in man's way of life which science has brought about, the problem of further improving and perfecting agricultural methods continues to hold a position of high priority for the human race. It is hard to believe that Ajubstitut can ever be found for the occupation of agriculture, a sacred task graciously conferred upon man by God to serve as the source of his well-being and the basis of his wealth. Share and Exchange Our country, Ethiopia, being blessed with an abundance of natural resources need not be anxious about her own needs. However, it is our constant endeavor and our firm desire, that our people will produce not only enough to meet their own requirements but that their production will enable them to share and exchange the fruits of their labor with other countries. If only Ethiopia, with an assured wealth of natural resources, would look at what the barren Sahara Desert has been made to produce by the endeavor of trained scientists, she would realize that science is a source of wealth. We would, therefore, have our students and scholars accept as their primary duty the attainment of scientific knowledge through education. We have placed our trust in this college to be the chief instrument for the attainment of this high goal, and we are confident that the students who have today received their diplomas from our hands, as well as those who follow them in the future, will through their achievements furnish us with tangible evidence of the fulfillment of this our purpose and our desire. Agriculture and industry are indispensable one to the other. Only close cooperation between these two branches of knowledge can guarantee the fulfillment of our program of economic development for our country. This college, which holds a prominent place in the plans we have laid down for the prosperity and welfare of our beloved people and country, can look forward to receiving the same constant support which we have shown in the past. It is with pleasure that we express on this occasion our gratitude to our great friend, the United States of America, for the generous and significant assistance they have given to this institution as p part of their great effort for the development of the spirit of cooperation and understanding among the nations of the world. We would request His Excellency the Ambassador to convey our thanks to his government. If the late Dr. Bennett, who laid the plans for this institution and whose great desire and tireless efforts to achieve the establishment of an agricultural and mechanical college in this country are well known to us, were with us today to see the fulfillment of his plans, how happy he would have been. With deep sorrow in our heart, remembering the words man proposes, God disposes, we pay a tribute to his memory in this hour. We would like to express our sincere thanks to the director of the Point 4 program in this country, the president and staff of this college, 
and all of our officials who have laboured to bring this institution into being. It is not enough for the children of Ethiopia to be recipients of education. They should never forget that the responsibility for passing on this knowledge to others and of handing it over to the next generation rests on them. January 16, 1958 Engineering College, Graduation The existence from ancient times of marble soft construction, among which Ethiopia proudly numbers the monuments at Aksum, the remarkable rock churches and other engineering wonders attest to the long history of the profession. It gives us great pleasure to be present here today to award degrees to the first graduates of this College of Engineering which we inaugurated with such high hopes but a few short years ago. This first graduation ceremony marks another step towards the fulfillment of the goal which we have set for ourselves and for our country in our overall program for the development of Ethiopia to which we have so long devoted ourselves. When we observe the tangible results produced by our program of education, to which we have dedicated the major portion of our time and efforts, it helps us to bear lightly the burden of our labors, and provide for us and for you as well an occasion for legitimate pride. Although the first institution where men received formal training in engineering was established only a little over 200 years ago, the science of engineering is one of the world's oldest. The existence from ancient times of marvels of construction, among which Ethiopia proudly numbers the monuments at Aksum, the remarkable rock churches and other engineering wonders attests to the long history of the profession. Even in our day, engineers are seen constantly adopting and adapting to their current needs the techniques developed in those remote times, thus fusing the ancient and the modern, the old and the new. As you advance in your profession, the value of thus combining ancient and modern skills will become apparent to you. Now that your formal education is over, you graduates, like engineering graduates the world over, will have to apprentice yourselves to senior engineers and acquire the necessary practical experience which alone can complete the training which you have received at this college. The degree which you receive today testifies to your growth in knowledge and training. But the measure of your growth in real artisanship remains to be revealed in the work which awaits you in your future careers. Your success in your profession will not depend on your possession of an engineering degree, it is rather to be judged by the service you render in future and by the tangible results of your labors. Having passed the academic test posed by this college, you now move on to face the more arduous tests posed by life. And the only way to face these tests successfully is to be spiritually prepared for them. Do not make the mistake of assuming that having taken your engineering degree you can put training and study behind you, and can afford to neglect the acquisition of further knowledge and skill. Man's education never stops, and in a profession as complex and difficult as yours, you must strive ceaselessly to put into practice your theoretical knowledge, and to keep yourselves abreast of new technical developments. If the product of your labors is not commensurate with the advantages you have received from education, your efforts thus far will be judged futile and worthless. Throughout your life, your mettle will be tested by the work you do, and your reputation will depend on the outcome of this test. It is, therefore, your duty to exercise lifelong vigilance to ensure that the fruits of your labors are worthy of the efforts spent on your education. If you, whose minds have been matured by education and to whom the torch of knowledge has been handed, fail to make a significant contribution to the welfare of your country, your responsibility shall be great indeed. In order faithfully to discharge this heavy responsibility, you must be men who love your nation and people, men of integrity and clear conscience, combining patience and humility. Be unswerving in your loyalty to your country which has given you so much and to which so much is due. Place your faith and trust in Almighty God, for, without his assistance and guidance, man is but a weak and puny creature. July 17, 1958 Public Health Graduation Gondar When we laid the foundation for the progress and development of the country, the fact that we granted the Constitution was in order to strengthen unity so that our country will be built around the idea of one emperor and one government in which everyone will be conscious of his duty based upon the principle of one for all and all for one. We have chosen education as our primary concern because we believe that it is the instrument by which our aims could be brought to fruition. 
The spirit of unity within Ethiopia around one emperor emanated from the people of Bagimdar, and their patriotic efforts have been crowned with laurels. We have made it our constant concern to help them in their quest for learning for which we have established the various schools and institutions of learning. Through education one can keep himself healthy, one can acquire the knowledge of many other things, but without health, education, and growth of a population are unattainable. Today when we present you with these certificates of accomplishment, our heart overflows with joy. Now that you are to begin the medical and health profession, we recommend that you work diligently, for treatment and cure alone is not enough for a country, prevention is also necessary. The Amhara race must know that it has an obligation on its part to work in the technical field, no matter at what level. To preserve the heritage of one's honor and culture is praiseworthy, but to exceed the limits may prove detrimental. We have ventured to say this because it has come to our knowledge that there exists here scorn for labor. We have come after having laid the foundation stones for the establishment of a textile factory, a hydroelectric plant and for a bridge in the development of highways in order to help in the advancement of the people of Bagimdar and Gajajam. Unless the people benefit through work our efforts and thoughts will have been in vain. They will have also violated the wish of the Almighty that by one's toil he must earn his living. Much cannot be accomplished in the pursuit of spiritual advancement, let alone that of material gains, without labor. Learn. Work. We have established community education so that both the youth and the adult may learn. Education and the quest for knowledge stop only at the grave. May 18, 1959. UCAA 6th Graduation. He who would be a leader must pay the price in self-discipline and moral restraint. This entails the correction and improvement of personal character, the checking of passions and desires, and an exemplary control of one's bodily needs and drives. This graduation ceremony is an occasion, not merely for recapitulating and recounting the fruits of past efforts in terms of examination results and of degrees and diplomas awarded, but also for fixing one's sights upon future accomplishments, obligations, and possibilities. For the sixth time in the history of this college, we see an imposing group of young men and women graduate from this institution. Most of you, as in previous years, will continue your studies and prepare yourselves for higher degrees and varying careers. But whether pursuing further studies or going directly into the world, all of you will soon be embarking upon a new stage of your lives. We, therefore, deem it necessary and appropriate, on these occasion when you of this year's graduating class look back upon your student years with a measure of nostalgia and look forward, perhaps with a measure of understandable apprehension towards your future careers, to speak to you about leaders and leadership. As you know, leadership is required in all fields and no field is without its usefulness. During our visits, however, to the educational institutions of our country, we have noticed, in answer to our inquiries, that the percentage of students pursuing courses of study useful for the development of technology and industry, has been extremely low. We have, therefore, counseled you to take up technological and industrial courses in preparing for an overall program. The reason for our introducing this topic at present is that we have found the number of those receiving degrees in technological subjects today to be very small indeed, and wish to impress upon you all that it is our desire to see a much larger number of our young people benefiting from the resources we have on our own and have received as aid from abroad, and graduating in the fields of technology and industrial education. The need for leadership. We all know that the need for good leadership in every walk of life is much greater today than ever before. Every aspect of living demands guiding hands, business, the professions, the fine arts, the mechanical arts, all. And all of you young people, who have been given the enriching opportunity of an advanced education will in the future be called upon to shoulder in varying degrees the responsibilities to leading and serving the nation. It is important, however, to remember that leadership does not mean domination. The world is always well supplied with people who wish to rule and dominate others. The true leader is of a different sort, he seeks effective activity which has a truly beneficent purpose. He inspires others to follow in his wake, and holding aloft the torch of wisdom, 
leads the way for society to realize its genuinely great aspirations. You have learned from your study of history that the story of nations is often told in terms of the accomplishments of individuals. In every significant event in history, you will find a courageous and determined leader, an inspiring goal or objective, and an adversary who sought to foil his efforts. In any normal society, everyone has some opportunity to show himself as a leader. Even the mechanic or clerk who has an assistant assigned to him not to speak of the doctor with all his helpers, or the officer who commands his troops, is a leader. Within his own sphere, each has the same opportunities for showing ability, and the same potential satisfactions as has the leader of a government. The leader is marked out by his individual craftsmanship, his sensibility and insight, his initiative and energy. The sense of responsibility. Leaders are people who raise the standards by which they judge themselves, and by which they are willing to be judged. The goal chosen, the objective selected, the requirements imposed, are not merely for their followers alone. They develop with consummate energy and devotion their own skill and knowledge in order to reach the standards they themselves have set. This wholehearted acceptance of the demands imposed by ever higher standards is the basis of all human progress. A love of high quality, we must remember, is essential in a leader. Dependability is another requirement in a leader. To be dependable is to be willing to accept responsibility, and to carry it out faithfully. A leader will always be willing to take counsel from his people, but will often have to act on what his own mind tells him is right. This demands that the leader has trained himself out of any inordinate fear of making mistakes. To embark successfully on a career involving leadership demands a courageous and determined spirit. Once a person has decided upon his life work, and is assured that in doing the work for which he is best endowed and equipped, he is filling a vital need, what he then needs is faith and integrity, coupled with a courageous spirit, so that, no longer preferring himself to the fulfillment of his task, he may address himself to the problems he must solve in order to be effective. One mark of the great leader is that he feels sufficiently secure to devote his thought and attention to the well-being of his subordinates and the perfection of his task, rather than being constantly worried about the approval or disapproval of others. He who would be a leader must pay the price in self-discipline and moral restraint. This entails the correction and improvement of personal character, the checking of passions and desires, and an exemplary control of one's bodily needs and drives. Leaders have to submit themselves to a stricter self-discipline and develop a more exemplary moral character than is expected of others. To be first in place, one must be first in merit as well. It should not surprise us then, to find that the greater number of acknowledged leaders have been people who train themselves in the art of discipline and obedience. He who has not learned to render prompt and willing service to others will find it difficult to win and keep the goodwill and cooperation of his subordinates. A leader must stay ahead. Further, a leader must possess initiative, which is the creative ability to think in new ways and do new things. The leader has always to stay ahead. He cannot afford to set up a procedure, and then fold his hands and linger lazily watching it work. He cannot be content merely to see new trends and take advantage of them. He must keep his imagination vividly alive, so as to originate ideas and start trends. A word of warning is in order here. To help one's subordinates or dependents at the cost of harm to the public, is tantamount to sacrilege and blasphemy. It is unfortunate, that many in positions of leadership, both great and small, have been found guilty of such practices. A good leader is devoted to his work and will willingly forego even the demands of sleep to see its accomplishment. This does not mean that he is impetuous. On the other hand, he maintains a balance between emotional drive and sound thinking. His labors, which sometimes appear excessive, derive from his firm realization that unless a man undertakes more than he can possibly do he will never be able to do all he can do. It is his enthusiasm that stimulates his energy. No matter what our point of departure in speaking of leadership, we reach the inescapable conclusion that the art of leadership consists in the ability to make people want to work for you, when they are really under no obligation to do so. The true leader is one who realizes by faith that he is an instrument in the hands of God, 
and dedicates himself to be a guide and inspirer of the nobler sentiments and aspirations of the people. He will kindle interest, teach, aid, correct and inspire. Those whom he leads will cooperate with him in maintaining discipline for the good of the group. He will instruct his followers in the goals towards which to strive, and create in them a sense of mutual effort for attaining the goal. Basic Aspirations To sum up, there is no power on earth, in this university or elsewhere, that can take a clerk from his desk or a mechanic from his bench, and easily mold him into a leader. To develop oneself, one has to develop one's own initiative and perseverance, a man has to strive in order to grow. As educated people, you will be looked up to, and much will be expected of you. You will be regarded, and rightly so, as those who have the necessary knowledge and the ability to inspire, to guide, and to lead. It is for this reason that we expect from you to whom we have given the opportunity of education in your chosen fields, great and productive service to our country. These fundamental ideas of which we have briefly spoken this day, constitute, we presume, part of the thought you have absorbed during the course of your studies in this university college. May these basic thoughts accompany you during the years ahead and aid you in accomplishing great things for our beloved country, Ethiopia. In conclusion, we would like to express our thanks and appreciation to the members of the faculty and the board of this university college for their zealous and untiring efforts for the growth of knowledge and the development of character in the young people who learn here. We would like especially to entrust our Vice Minister of Education, on the basis of the statement made by him regarding the expansion and growth of education in the country, with the high responsibility of assiduously and untiringly striving to carry out the schemes mentioned and the decisions made by the board. July 17, 1959 Graduation, Building College You, the students who leave these halls today, have justified the trust and confidence which your government has reposed in you in selecting you for attendance at this school from among the many who have clamored and who still clamor for the opportunity to study here. In your future work, in your daily life and activities, be ever mindful to prove yourselves worthy of trust. Let all that you do contribute to the ultimate benefit of your motherland and your fellow men. Let your work always be such that you can take pride in it, and if you do so, your country will have reason to be proud of you. July 14, 1961 18-